Welcome back, Bartonella buddies. If you're new here, my name is Jake. My mom asked my dad, do we have the nerve to name a girl Jake? And my dad said, hell yeah. Today, let's talk about, <laughs> that gonna be too loud. Take out your headphones. <laughs> Today, let's talk about neuropsychiatric symptoms in Bartonellosis. The first thing I want to say is that this is a super important topic and that fact is not lost on me even though I don't experience neuropsychiatric symptoms of Bartonellosis. This one video will not do this topic justice and if I don't have the opportunity to address something that you think that I should address in a future video then please leave that in the comments. And before we get into it I would really appreciate it if you would consider subscribing to my channel before the end of this video if you found any of it uh, informative or useful. I'm also going to leave timestamps in the video description box and along the bottom bar so you can see when I address each topic almost like chapters in a book. When I first started researching for this video, my first thought was, well, what's the difference between neurological symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, and neuropsychiatric symptoms? And this is a complicated question, and I'm sure one could do their entire PhD thesis on this topic alone, which is not what we are doing today, Satan, not today. I did, however, read one study that I found pretty interesting that tried to determine if neurological disorders affected different parts of the brain than psychiatric disorders. Now keep in mind this is just one study and of course every study has its limitations. Some of the neurological disorders that they looked at included ALS, MS, and dementia in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And some of the psychiatric disorders they looked at were schizophrenia, OCD, and PTSD. The authors did find key differences between neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders. One was that disorders within one group were more similar to each other than disorders of the other group. Two, psychiatric disorders implicated the frontal lobe more often. And three, psychiatric disorders were more heterogeneous or varied than neurological disorders. However, the authors conclude that instead of considering neurological disorders disorders of the brain and psychiatric disorders disorders of the mind, they both should be considered disorders of the central nervous system. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to focus on what we typically think of as psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety, derealization, hallucinations, OCD, etc. But since psychiatric disorders, probably many of them have a neurological component and since the distinctions are a bit messy, I'm going to refer to them as neuropsychiatric symptoms from here on out. Now let's start with what the literature says. Did you think I was going to really start anywhere else? You should know me by now. But first, I just want to make one thing clear. Just because I reference an article or author or set of authors, that doesn't mean that I agree with everything they've ever written. The literature on Bartonellosis and neuropsych symptoms is in its infancy. You can't prove that neuropsych symptoms are caused by a bacterial infection, especially a chronic bacterial infection, if you can't find the infection. And you can't find the infection unless you have good testing, which we haven't had until recently. Thank you to Dr. Breitschwert, his colleagues, NC State, and Galaxy. Round of applause! But encephalitis, due to cat scratch disease, has actually been reported in the literature for almost 70 years. But remember, cat scratch disease is an acute manifestation of a Bartonella infection. While the term Bartonellosis is a new term that researchers are using to refer to chronic manifestations of a Bartonella infection. The first reported case of cat scratch disease encephalitis was all the way back in 1949. A 13-year-old boy had a seizure and fell into a coma and was admitted to the hospital. After he left the hospital, he suffered from neuropsychiatric symptoms such as restlessness, irritability, nightmares, and he recovered from all of them as far as we know. Since then, dozens of cases of encephalitis and encephalopathy due to Bartonella hensley and other Bartonella species like Bartonella quintana have been reported in the scientific literature. Many of these symptoms involved neurological symptoms in addition to neuropsychiatric symptoms, and some of these cases involved symptoms outside of the central nervous system as well. Some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms have included combative and aggressive behavior, sleep disturbances, flattened affect, and personality changes. But between 2007 and 2011 is when studies started to mount that showed a link between bacteremic patients and chronic symptoms, as opposed to acute acute cases of cat scratch disease. Some of these symptoms were neuropsychiatric, including irritability, depression, and insomnia. In a study of patients who had animal exposure, 
84% were found to be bacteremic with Bartonella through ePCR. Of those who were ePCR positive, approximately 67% experienced sleeplessness, 54% experienced irritability, and 30% experienced depression. There have also been several case reports of patients found to be bacteremic with Bartonella who had neuropsychiatric symptoms. In my video called Bartonella Success Stories, which I will link in the top right corner of your screen and down in the video description box for you to watch, I recount in detail of an 18-year-old woman who suffered from neuropsychiatric symptoms like depression, mood swings, anxiety, visual and auditory hallucinations, and other non-neuropsychiatric symptoms. Also, dissociative episodes. These symptoms resolve completely following antibiotic therapy. In another case report, a woman and her two papillon dogs were infested by rat mites. Or should I say papillon? Papillon est français pour butterfly. J'aime bien faire le fête. That means I like to party a lot. Before? Avant? I got sick. Je suis tombée malade de Bartonella. Nous voudrions aller à Gotha, s'il vous plaît. Which means we would like to go to the club Gotha. Which is where? En Cannes et le sous, ou, sous de France. 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 <laughs> Une fun fact. Papillon is French for butterfly and refers to the dog breed's wing-shaped ears. Not only did the two dogs develop clinical signs and symptoms, but the owner was hospitalized due to her symptoms. And since this is a neuropsychiatric video, I'm going to focus on those. So her neuropsychiatric symptoms were uncontrollable panic attacks, depression, and lethargy. Barnella Hensley was amplified from her blood by ePCR. And this study also shows us that rat mites should be looked into as a possible vector for Bartonella. Now this next case report, I think y'all are going to find super interesting if you haven't read it already. And if you haven't, you should, because I think a lot of the symptoms will resonate with many of you and it's pretty easy to understand and it's a success story. This study was published in 2019 and tells the story of a 14-year-old boy who had a sudden onset of neuropsychiatric symptoms like depression, feeling overwhelmed, feeling agitated, and confused, looking at my script. <laughs> he had homicidal thoughts towards loved ones, which in turn made him feel suicidal. He became unable to attend school and became increasingly less functional. He developed obsessive and intrusive thoughts, mood swings, rage, phobias, and irrational fears. He had psychosis and believed that he had special powers and that the pet cat wanted to kill him. He had visual, auditory, and tactile hallucinations, and his mother had to quit her job to provide him with full-time care. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and obsessive compulsive disorder and was given a variety of medications to help manage his symptoms, including antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, and benzodiazepines. The family then went to see a neurologist who suspected autoimmune encephalitis based on positive ANA titers and increasing CRP levels. He was given rituximab, which is a medication that is used for various autoimmune diseases and cancer. And this intervention did decrease the severity of the psychotic episodes, but he still struggled daily with his symptoms. I just messed up the, the camera stand. He was then tested by Dr. Breitschwer and his team, and they found Bartonella Hensley in his blood through ePCR. He was then started on uh, antibiotics. The boy was then started on antibiotic therapy and eventually his symptoms started to decrease and he was able to stop his antipsychotic medications. Okay, so now I'm gonna scoot over here so that my big old head, I know I don't look like I have a big head, but it's, it's big. Um, and I can put the picture right here. So this is my favorite picture and I'll tell you why. I love looking at this picture. So basically this is a timeline of the medications that he took over a four year period. The red pink panel represents 24 hour psychosis. The yellow panel represents clearing of psychosis and the green panel represents when he was completely clear of psychosis. On the left hand side, you will see that he was given typical 
psych meds like Abilify, Seroquel, and Lithium, and his symptoms of psychosis did not improve with any of these medications. The psychosis only really started to clear when he started taking antibiotics like doxycycline, and then later azithromycin and rifampin, which were then switched out to clarithromycin, rifabutin, and minocycline, along with several other therapies. So after missing nearly two years of school, the boy fully recovered. He went back to school, earned all A's, got a job as a server, and was hanging out with friends again. Based on this case report, the authors, Arthurs, they're not all named Arthur. <laughs> Based on this case report, the authors argue that neurobartonellosis or the infection of the brain by Bartonella should be considered in those with pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome or PANS and in those whose psychiatric symptoms don't respond to typical psych meds. So after reading all this research, my next question was how fringe or mainstream is the idea that infections can cause neuropsychiatric illness. And after a quick Google search, I came across this article from Psychiatric Times that you have to read if you are able. So the authors write about how two scientists in the early 1900s discovered that a condition called general paresis of the insane, which obviously is not a nice term, but it was the early 1900s, so what can you expect? Um, so now it's just called general paresis. So these two scientists discovered that general paresis was caused by long-term syphilis infection. General paresis is characterized by many, many neuropsychiatric symptoms, that, and I can't list all of them, but some of them include insomnia, mania, delusions, and depression. The two scientists named Noguchi and Moore demonstrated the presence of syphilitic spirochetes in the brains of those who died from general paresis. And when I read the name Noguchi, I was like, I know of a Noguchi doing research in the early 1900s. I mean, how many researchers named Noguchi were doing research in the early 1900s on bacteria? So, if you recall from my video, Can Ticks Transmit Bartonella? Noguchi was the first scientist to demonstrate that ticks can transmit Bartonella bacilliformis from rhesus macaque to rhesus macaque. And when I put that all together, I was like, this guy should be called the grandfather of infectious disease or something. But then I read his Wikipedia page and apparently he inoculated orphan children with syphilis, so um, maybe we shouldn't give him that title. He wasn't ever apprehended for inoculating orphan children with syphilis because he also inoculated himself with syphilis, so apparently that made it okay? Early 1900s. Later in life, he became erratic, volatile, paranoid, and secretive, and he was diagnosed with late-stage syphilis, and he refused treatment. Early 1900s. My mom just told me that volatile is pronounced volatile, and I didn't know it, but then I looked it up, and in the UK, it's like this. Volatile. So, I'm Gucci. I hear that's what Gen Z says, so I said it. I'm a millennial, by the way. The Psychiatry Times article then goes on to explain that during the influenza of 1918 to 1919, there was an increased incidence afterwards of encephalitis lethargica. Encephalitis lethargica is characterized by brain inflammation and symptoms including lethargy, catatonia, dyskinesia, Parkinsonism, and behavioral changes like psychosis. The authors write that increased influenza control measures might be responsible for the reduced rate of encephalitis lethargica today. Do you know what has also been documented to cause encephalitis lethargica? Bartonella! There's a case report in the video description box if you would like to read it, but in sum, a 16-year-old girl presented to the hospital with a whole slew of symptoms, including lethargy, disorientation, and nocturnal insomnia with an inverted sleep schedule. She fully recovered after antibiotic therapy. So now, you might be wondering how two different pathogens, both Bartonella and the flu, can cause encephalitis lethargica. Or you might be wondering why Bartonella can cause such a wide array of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Or you might be wondering why some people don't develop neuropsychiatric symptoms at all. 
Or you might be staring blankly at the screen, wondering when this woman is going to stop talking. This all ties back in to the host response. If you haven't seen my video on the host response, make sure to watch it after this video because it's very informative if I do say so myself. Each person's own individual immune system responds to different pathogens in a different way. Science doesn't know a whole lot about the host response, but it is likely that genetics slash epigenetics age, environment, comorbidities, diet, and the microbiome play a role. The authors of the Psychiatric Times article argue that we need to move away from the one pathogen equals one disease model, which is also the argument that Dr. Amanda Elam made in my interview with her. She's the CEO slash president of Galaxy Diagnostics. Here is the clip. There's usually one pathogen causes one disease. I mean, the research coming out of vector-borne disease is really challenging that. I'm sure that was enough. In infectious disease, the prevailing thought is that each infectious agent causes exactly one disease with a very specific set of symptoms. So for example, Bartonella Hensley, the prevailing thought is that it mostly or only causes calf scratch disease and rarely manifests in any other way. But Bartonella can cause a very serious illness called endocarditis and recent research shows that Bartonella can cause a wide array of various rheumatological, neurological, psychiatric, and general symptoms like fatigue and headaches. Or take the bacteria Streptococcus group A. We generally think of this bacteria as causing strep throat, which is characterized by fever, swollen lymph nodes, and a sore throat, and generally red and swollen tonsils, sometimes with white patches or streaks of pus. Side note, ever since I discovered white blood cells, <laughs> I discovered the white blood cell. You can call me the grandmother of the white blood cell. Side note, ever since I learned that pus is just white blood cells clumped together, I've found it a little bit less disgusting. Still disgusting, just slightly less so. But we now know that infection with strep can lead to a disorder called PANDAS, which stands for Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. PANDAS! I'm only excited about these kind of PANDAS. And PANDAS is not a fringe idea in the medical world. There's even a page about it on the NIH website. And then if you need even more evidence about the link between infections and neuropsychiatric illness, there's a great paper from the journal called JAMA Psychiatry, which is the journal of the American Medical Association. The study looked at over 1 million children. Yes, you heard that right. Over 1 million children in Denmark. Are there even over 1 million children in Denmark? Well, over a 17 year period, which is what the study looked at, yes. I'm sorry, Denmark. I've been there with my mom. It was lovely. In short, the authors found that infections requiring hospitalizations were associated with an increased risk of being diagnosed with a mental disorder. And this risk increased with the amount of infections. Some of these disorders included OCD, schizophrenia, personality and behavior disorders, ADHD, oppositional defiant and conduct disorder, and tic disorders. However, the authors argued that their findings should be interpreted along with confounding factors like I almost said genital. Genetic and familial genital. However, the authors argue that their findings should be interpreted with other confounding factors, such as genetic, familial, and socioeconomic factors, which ties back into the host response. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that antibiotic use was associated with a particularly increased risk of being diagnosed with a mental disorder. Does that mean that antibiotics cause mental disorders? No, this study cannot prove causality. Does this mean that if your child is septic, you shouldn't give them antibiotics? No, because then they could die. What this does mean is that antibiotics should be used judiciously and they should not be inappropriately prescribed like in the case of a viral infection. It also means that the idea that antibiotics can negatively impact the microbiome and then contribute to neuropsychiatric illness through the gut-brain axis is an idea that deserves more research. 
And finally, it means that we need further research into ways of how to mitigate damage to the microbiome, whether that be through probiotics or prebiotics and at what dosage and how often. So back to arguing against that one pathogen equals one disease model, the authors of the Psychiatric Times article write, and I'm going to read this to you, Recent discoveries have shown that many neuropathic infectious agents have complex mechanisms that allow them to lie dormant within the brain for extensive periods with little evidence of classic inflammatory reactions. Microorganisms capable of this latency include a, di a diverse range of taxa, including viruses such as herpes simplex virus types 1 and 2, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus, as well as retroviruses such as human immunodeficiency virus, measles virus, bacteria such as chlamydiae and Borreliae, and protozoa such as Toxoplasma gondii. I think that's how I say it. Because the pattern of response to infectious agents is similar, microorganisms from widely diverse taxa can cause similar activation of immune processes and hence similar clinical pictures. Did you notice what was missing of that list of microorganisms? Bartonella! I might have to email these people. That's my favorite thing to do in my videos is throw things out of the view. <laughs> Since there's not a lot of scientific data out there on Bartonellosis and neuropsychiatric symptoms, I conducted a very unscientific poll in our support group called Breaking Down Bartonella. So keeping in mind that this is not supposed to be a scientific poll, out of 108 respondents who reported neuropsychiatric symptoms, these were the top five. Coming in in first place, drum roll please. Drum roll please. Anxiety at 73%. Tied for second place were insomnia and sleep disturbances and irritability, so those were 64%. Third place was depression, and that was 54%. Fourth place was emotional liability or mood swings, which was 44%. And fifth place was panic attacks, which came in at 36%. But people also reported other symptoms like OCD, rage, phobias, depersonalization, and suicidal ideation. And some people reported auditory, visual, tactile, and or olfactory hallucinations. And some people reported eating disorders, thoughts of self-harm, aggressive behavior, and delusions. Please know that if you are suffering from any of these symptoms, you're not alone and you're not insane. Luckily, we're not in the early 1900s. And if you want support, as well as information and resources, please join our Facebook group called Breaking Down Bartonella, and I'll put the link to that, as always, in the video description box. I'm not a doctor, nor have I done nearly enough research to cover the topic of treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms in Bartonellosis, but I was chatting with a few of my Bartonella buddies online, and we were discussing how the treatment should be similar to the guidelines that are used by PANS experts. PANS experts use a three-pronged approach. One is to treat the neuropsychiatric symptoms either with cognitive behavioral therapy and or psychiatric medications. Two, remove the source of inflammation through antimicrobial therapy. And three, treat disturbances of the immune system with immunomodulatory therapies and or anti-inflammatory therapies. And the more I thought about this approach, the more I realized that this approach applies to every patient sick with Bartonellosis. We all need symptom management, whether that be for pain, anxiety, or GI distress. We all need to address the Bartonella infection through antimicrobials. And we all need to address the immune dysregulation caused by Bartonella, whether that be MCAS or IgG deficiencies or autoimmune encephalitis or some yet to be discovered or characterized immune dysregulation. If you watched my host response video, you will know that for some patients like me, the immune dysregulation accounts for most of their symptoms. I honestly had a really great time researching and writing this video. Hopefully I didn't bore you to death and and if I did and you suffer from insomnia, then maybe you can watch this video and it can help put you to sleep. Working on this video has helped distract me from my woes over here, so thank you to all my Bartonella buddies who suggested this topic, who sent me research, and who voted in my poll. If you haven't subscribed yet, I would really appreciate it if you would consider doing so. It helps support my channel and my morale, and so does giving this video a thumbs up and leaving a comment down below.
Piper says, I would give you a thumbs up, but I don't have thumbs. That's okay, Piper. You can give me a dew claw up. But no, don't lick me. Bye, Bartonella buddies. This video took a really long time to film. I took one nap, three meal breaks, and by the end of the day, I almost was having a nervous breakdown. So I'm gonna show you what my mom did to lift my spirits. Okay, how are you cheering me up? Okay, it's gonna be okay. We're gonna finish your video. It's only one more page. It's gonna be fine. <laughs>